Hello. Today we are talking to someone I actually met when he passed through Kansas City with his book on a in a writers conference. Um, so coming to us from Bainbridge Island, Washington, Stephen Rally. Stephen, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to see you both. It's nice, nice to, to see, see you. you. Yeah. So tell us the name of your book to start off with. It's called The Lost Coin: A Memoir of Adoption and Destiny. Came okay. out last uh, uh, last uh, September. Right. Yes, we're gonna... I, I'm lucky to have a copy of it. You see, is I'm a little jealous, and we're going to put a link in our show notes. Pardon? We're going to put a link oh. in our show notes for you. Great. Okay. A link to your book. Mm-hmm. Link to the book. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yep. So well, my website has takes you there anyway, and has all those other things I just mentioned, all the podcasts and reviews and articles I've written and so forth. So yeah, we'll we'll put the link to your website as well. Thanks. We'll start start from yeah. the beginning. So origin, how would you like to tell your story from the beginning or back into it? Well, um, two years ago, uh, two years ago and one month ago, uh, as I write about in the book, I got a twenty three and me notification from a first cousin, which was the first time I've ever had that. I've been with 23andMe since the almost the very beginning. And uh, that got my attention. And uh, within minutes, a guy who thought I was his cousin and realized the age difference didn't make, make sense. They said, you know, I think you might be related to my mother. Let me get a hold of her. And within minutes, I was emailing somebody who, uh, and when I told them what I knew about my birth father, uh, the little I did, it, 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 was, it was a question that that, he was my birth father and they so it was a big shock to her and her other three um uh sisters Mm -hmm. whom i all met who was she who was she to you she was my she's my her her father and my birth father the same person oh so after all she's your sister is what is shortcut sister (laughs) right yeah she's my half sister -sister. -sister. okay yeah of course we share a birth father so I hadn't really been looking. I wasn't, I mean, I had my uh, fishing line, in, you know, in, in the, the lake, but I wasn't paying attention. So now I'll contrast in a minute to finding my birth mother. But uh, so it was a revelation. And just within minutes, we're exchanging emails and pictures. And suddenly I knew his name, the full name, his full, a bit of a story about him. Um, later, I, f- I realized after doing the math that at the time I was conceived or, and or born that uh uh, that uh, he already had probably two two children, probably under the age of seven. Um, mm-hmm. the, the 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 other guy who I talked to originally said something like, "Grandpa was a we think he was a bit of a player," which may have been an understatement. I'm not sure. <laughs> fact, I don't know how people had affairs back then. I mean, no no email, no phones. I mean, how do you communicate? Standing anyway. meeting. So, but then the pictures came and. Uh, uh, it was unmistakable, uh, and uh, I'm flattering myself to say it this way. But his 19 year old picture was a uh, it was a spit image of of uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, also, I can say that back to marketing back to Kansas City, and my mother, <laughs> who I, birth mother, who I uh, you know referred to as uh, uh, looked like a young Jean Tierney. In fact, I had her picture while I was beside her for two years. So, I'm like I said, it's self flattering to uh, say they're both fairly good looking people, but they but from the time. As they reconstructed it, he 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 left her life and left me um, her pregnant, and uh, that's when her father, I assume, took her down to Kansas City and to the Will's Maternity Sanitarium. So anyway, all of that folded a year, uh, two years ago when I got to know them a little, saw all okay. these pictures. Of- I, I had had was this the first time in your entire life right, that you had any kind of like had you not done any search for your mother prior to that or you just for, oh for my mother for sure but I'm gonna oh. like I'm sort of starting at the end uh, so oh, okay okay uh, but I never had the drive to meet him only her right but when this happened and with it literally within a day the, the lights went off on and I said I, this is the time to write so I sat down and wrote six six days a week six hours a day till Labor Day and uh, had my first draft. And I had also noodle on this uh, uh, something like this. So I wasn't cold, totally cold when I was at uh, Pacific Graduate Institute. So anyway, that has un- that has been, um, to a point, it's been revealing. I-, I know who they are. I know where they live. I know he was a, uh, uh, was a uh, lettered in four sports at uh, Indiana University. But one of the, one of the, my half sisters said, yeah, it's a good thing that you didn't, uh, 
ever meet him, you had never gotten along. <laughs> you're, you're, you're completely what he was not. Uh, and uh, by contrast, I think it was much more like my birth mother. But so. Steven, that, I, were they, know, sure. oh, sorry, were they raised by him? So these were these the children yes. that he had yeah. prior That's what to, I'm your, to your yeah. birth? Yeah. His wife and he had four children. Okay. Uh, this took place in Iowa, but eventually they settled back in Indiana and they all had seemingly stable, you know, grown up lives. I mean, he, you know, taught them all how to play basketball and golf. And uh, uh, they all became, I think all but one, three were teachers. One was a CPA. They all have big families. There's a, their family tree is loaded right, with just families and stuff. Is there more on the family tree since he was a player? Yes, there is. A, <laughs> I, I, at least one that I know of. They told me <laughs> in the beginning, you know, they go, the guy, the guy who contacted me said, you know, if you talk to my mother, it may not be received well because about however many months or a year ago, another woman from San Diego, about a year <laughs> older than you are, contacted them um, and they didn't take lightly to it. They didn't like it. And uh, so, uh, but it was. So you had, that, you had that warning going into this. And they, on Ancestry, they, they've, they've listed her. I can't remember if they oh. have a name, but the, uh, so they acknowledge that. Now that said, in terms of just sort of the, intrigue and unraveling things uh, they were they're certainly very gracious and they answered a lot of my not all my questions but some of them but i was a uh, you know it's different when you're the one that's out you know, when you're the right bastard child so to speak and they're not and uh it, i think it, i think it stirred old wounds i think for them in in ways that i can understand so but a couple of times i pushed pressed in a little bit harder about what do you mm -hmm. think your mom knew like, then i didn't it, things just stopped but that's okay i understand that it's not a blame game at all okay so, so, yeah, I want to ask you, because you're talking about wounds. What about wounds? Did you have growing up, like when you were coming up, I know you put yourself on Ancestry in 23andMe. Did you have before that, like, why were you looking? I mean, tell tell us a little well, bit about your life, you know? Yeah, well, when I was, I was always told that I was uh, adopted by my parents. Uh, I was always very aware that I, <laughs> even though I didn't think of it in these terms, but looking back that I had, you know, my dad was a surgeon. My mom had been a nurse. We grew up in a nice home, uh, you know, uh, encouraging of, of education, certainly loved and taken care of. So that was all given. I mean, that was my all American boy life growing up. And, uh, but were you an 13, only child in that family? I was for five years. And then after, uh, after then, then my, my parents had three of their own children. I mean, my brothers yeah. and sisters, I have two brothers and a, and a sister. So, uh, but at age 13, I became more curious. And so I asked, my mother at the time, I, I write about this in the book. Uh, I wanted to know more. What could she tell me? And she blew up and sort of said, don't you think we love you enough? What's wrong with you? Yeah. And I was so shamed and so angry that I ran upstairs, slammed the door, and I swore to myself I would never, ever, ever talk to her about my adoption again. And I didn't. Never. Ever. Even, wow. Even when, even <laughs> when I found my birth mother and even when she... I knew that she knew that I had. Neither of us talked about it. Now, no, the, in the book, unspoken. Yeah. This this rupture had a very curious and interesting way that we repaired uh, basically on our hundredth birthday. So that was another. That's another story altogether. But it's in the book. So anyway, from that point, when I was that age, uh, this is uh, we're talking. Uh, well, I think uh, Sarah, you might have heard me say this at the at the library in Kansas City that the uh, the day before my fifteenth birthday was the was the day the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. So that's how that's how old I am. That's like we're dating that <laughs> back cool. in those days. But but you know, so um, but in those pre-internet days, there wasn't any Googling anything. So I knew I'd have to wait to go to college to begin writing letters and, and requesting records, which I did. I kept all the correspondence. Uh, I went through two directors. Uh, I found out later that uh, the one who was so paternalistic, I think he was a Catholic priest in his spare time. <laughs> Uh, but was actually doing something quite unique in terms of adoption agency. They did, they did a, a major attempt to link the right kid with the right parent. It wasn't like uh -huh. parents came in, like shopping, like we like that cute one, we'll take him. So he they really did a thorough assessment of the parents and uh, before they matched you with a child. And I think at that point they said, here's the kid we think should be yours. So that was a stroke of luck, great uh -huh. fate. So when you, so this is a question outside of that. When you were, when you were young, I was talking to somebody about this the other night is why I'm asking. And from your generation. Okay. Wait, so your mom shut you down, but you always felt like, I want to know who I am. 
that because that's right. a thing that this yeah. is what i was right. talking about right like people it, it can took, be shut down and not talk about it doesn't mean they don't want to know who they are no that's right for sure well but you mentioned the primal wound now it, it took some uh a lot more <laughs> consciousness on my part and also becoming a psychotherapist after 40 years in, yeah. in education sure. That I find, kind of found the language, if you will, uh, Nancy right. Verrier's book on the primal wound. But that was, in fact, what the kind of the core of the book is about, is that the, the outer stories. Uh, and Sarah, you know, that when we were at the, in the library, and you've heard a bazillion of them anyway, but I mean, uh, those stories are all really different. They're all over the map in terms of people's adoption stories or their uh, birth parent stories. But on the inside, my belief is that that separation of mother and child represents a form of developmental trauma. It's a primal wound. Now, did I think, I think I that's had a pretty problem? widely acknowledged now, yeah. I think. It is now. Hopefully. Yeah. You don't walk around thinking, oh, I have a primal wound. No. But you rec recognize that in retrospect, uh, the sense of yearning, the sense of longing, of not being able to kind of quite. I was having lunch with somebody who adopted their child uh, young, and she, both, well, the girl's life, who's now 27, all over the map, moving constantly, not being able to keep a job in this kind of school, that kind of school, boyfriend here moving there. And I liken it as does her mother to that primal wound. So now that's not, a, that's not fatal. It's not like you, you become life's, you know, uh, poster child for being a victim, but it does mean that you could carry that around, not knowing what it is yeah. and not really well, putting it is two fatal two for together. Some. Although, right. It is fatal for some. We uh, adopted yeah. people are four times more likely to commit suicide. Right. Right. Overrepresented in treatment centers, drug addiction, and substance abuse, and mm. right. in prison. Right. So, right. I mean, right. it can easily and be I don't fatal. Know, it, it, and I'm familiar with that data, but I'm not familiar with looking at, say, uh, what I'm calling developmental trauma mm. uh, as per adoption and separation of mother and child compared to early childhood trauma of other kinds psychological tra trauma, uh, uh, physical, sexual abuse, th those kind of things. I mean, they're both forms of trauma. And the way I think the psyche, uh, at least my own training says, we, we, we react in, in a very similar ways to th that, that wound. Uh, but I think the trauma wound in terms of those deep, uh, what uh, Winnicott calls primitive agonies, are just this dark, almost like a like in an orchestra, a bass sound that's so deep you don't even yeah. hear it as a sound. It's just a rumble. Now, so I was really what did tuned, you call what what did he call primitive agonies? Prim, they called he called them primitive agonies. Huh. Something that's almost primordial. I mean, kind of mm, like that's so a... fundamental. I mean, abandonment would be one. Right. Just basic out fear would be another one. Uh, the fear of death would be another one. Uh, so there's not a discrete list, but those, that kind of undulation deep within. Yeah. And some people in lives don't necessarily have to ever experience that. But I dare say, if you uh, say a soldier in combat would. Uh, probably if they're in a tight pinch, you know, it's you or them probably on a fear level, probably experience what that total terror would feel like. So anyway, uh, back to my story. The uh, So uh, it wasn't until uh, the new director came in, uh, in their early, let me come in, probably late 70s, a guy who's still alive and who I've met. Uh, he was the, became, the for, became the mayor of Ottumwa, Iowa for, I think, four terms. Great guy. And he was the one who basically, a different attitude. Uh, he wasn't paternalistic. He said, I, I can't give you this, much of your sealed records. That's not legal on my part. But he sent me a, pe a sheet of paper and said, I hope this will help. Well, when I read it, it was like it was like the jackpot. It's like, I can figure stuff out from here. I Now I'm, the game is on. So I, Do you feel uh, like he purpose, purposely like gave you more uh, clues you know no kind question, of because he had known about my interest i had actually written a letter for him to the iowa state legislature to try to uh, uh loosen up the the uh, Birth uh the laws and regulations so he was it was already a friendly relationship and so yeah he knew what he was doing he told me so when i met him so, but but later kind of like i can't give you anything but here's a little something yeah and then later he gave me my entire uh oh. my entire sealed, sealed records that's another part of the book so anyway so from that i i knew my birth, birth mother's uh, name and my birth father's name although in that case it was misspelled one of the reasons i could never really find him so i went to a little town in iowa uh with i was in education i was a i think yeah, i was a principal at the time 
mid July, I'm in flip flops and a Hawaiian shirt. I look like I just <laughs> blew off the beach. This little tiny town. I go to the high school. And like I get there, it's the doors locked. And I'm going, oh, it's stupid. It's like it's summer vacation. No one's here. So because I wanted to get the yearbook, so I went to the public library and they had an old copy of a 1944 yearbook and she said i'm amazed we have this so they didn't there was a paper shortage they didn't even have covers on things it's just stapled wow. so after flipping through pages and searching here i finally found a picture of her and i just is that the pic uh, first picture you'd seen that was the first one i saw and i was like uh, my jaw i mean i just it was just not i was just kind of like my bell rang because it's like i'm looking at myself if that had been a girl at age right. 15 i'm looking at me so from that I stole a, a, a phone book on the way out the door. Okay, I was living in the Bay Area at the time. I like. Oh, first of all, I need well, to that's picture why I this. Have to yeah. steal things. All right. <laughs> I'd like to see the flip flops, the Hawaiian shirt, and you stealing a phone book. This it, it's the uh, it's the sort of the Tom Selleck look, a Magnum right? guy, okay? <laughs> So anyway, so I go back home, and so I take the phone book and I write everybody in the county uh, with the same last name. And say, and I was by then a doc. I had my PhD, so I was a doctor. And she had been a nurse and said, oh. for the purposes of a reunion, I'd like to, I'm looking for, and gave her name. Can you help me at all find where she is? I got nothing back, nothing for weeks. And then finally, one day, a small little uh, envelope came with this little piece of paper. It just had her name with a new, oh. her new married name uh, and where she lived. And so, well, the game was definitely on it. So I wrote her. I kept a copy of that letter, and part of that's in the book. And uh, but then I got a, a, a came home from work, and I, there was a on my message machine said, uh, uh, "Hi, this is, I, I forget what name I gave her. I think I call her Patty in the book. Anyway, uh, this is Patty. Uh, my my mom and your birth mother are the same person, but we are not sure we can give her your letter. We've intercepted it, and we have to take it to her psychiatrist." to see if she's even stable enough to read it, let alone oh. see you. Oh. So, and then she went, then I think I talked to her within a day and then I understood that she had just been in a halfway house. Prior to that, she had been wandering the streets of a no. large urban area. You're a bag lady and she had been, as I then later learned, had been addicted to pharmaceuticals from, and that was one of the reasons of being a nurse. She stole drugs and got fired ah. from job after job. A lot of alcohol, and by the time uh, just before I was there, she was she had been in a halfway house. So I told uh, whatever I call her, Patty. Uh, I said, "I'm coming one way or the other. Yeah. I am coming." Now, if I can't meet her, I'll have to accept that. But I am going to see her. If I have to stand I, across the seat, I'm going to see her. I have a question: Was Patty older or younger? Was she born after younger. you? Younger. My birth so mother you, was. Were a, you the was first? A, yeah, but but uh, she married soon after she gave uh, me up for adoption, and then my there's three there are two girls and, and a boy. Uh, the, the oldest girl is just eleven, so she she got pregnant right after she gave she the baby came in uh, eleven months after me. So, but which, I understand which you know, the, there's no healing in that, right? There's. I understand <laughs> then. Now looking back, and after meeting right. her, which I'll met, mention in a second, that. I realized that uh, what an unbelievable sacrifice not only was to give me up, but the price she had paid through all of her life. Of course. Un horrible man to get married to. Uh, the, the two girls anyway, particularly the older one, who told me about their lives growing up, was a train wreck. And I kept thinking, it could have been me. I mean, if she had kept me, I could have been living this life, I think. And so I was spared that. Or so, she went to that life because she gave you up right, a sliding it's, door, right? Uh -huh, you never, no. ne I mean, perhaps her, she had her own, you know, as also lots of evidence of birth mothers having trauma when they give up their There's child. Absolutely no question about that in my uh -huh. mind. And uh, the picture I had of her not too long before I was, uh, she, like I said, she was really quite a, a cute young woman. But uh, of course, by the time I met her, uh, life had really taken a toll on her. Um, yeah. So the story is once, so I flew back East. Um, she knew I was coming. Um, I, Patty took me, drove me to this uh, kind of a, a dismal sort of tenement apartment, um, knocked on the door and uh, the door opens a crack. I can just barely see her. She can see me. And she goes, what the hell are you doing here? Right? Nobody asked you to come. I didn't give you my address. Oh. <laughs> so she, I'm knew, going, okay. she knew who you were. Yeah, she knew who I was, and 
knew I was coming, you know. Oh, okay. And, they had told her. Okay. So she had a little bit of what happened there. Well, so I was taken aback to be sure, but I kept my powder dry. So I had brought some uh, a box of long stem roses for her and uh, she opened the door just a little bit more. I gave these to her. I said, I said, just let's just say I, I've been looking for you for a while. I wasn't like somebody just gave me your address. So I've been looking for since I was 13 years old. I'm 40 at the time. So she then she said, which just caught me off guard. She said, huh, well, no one's ever given me flowers before. Oh. And I thought that was so heart wrenching yeah. to hear somebody say that. So she lets me in and we go into this. Uh, it was a clean apartment, but it was just it was it was run down. It was like 1950s for mica this and old, you know, uh, yeah. plastic chairs. And but she mentioned that uh, that uh, she said, well, a lot of my stuff's in storage. And uh, I go, oh, yeah, like and I, and she said, yeah, all my books are in storage. I go, I'm just really grabbing at straws to know what to talk. And I go, no, how many books do you have? And she said, oh, five or six hundred. At oh. that time, the light bulb, the light bulbs went off. I was like five or six hundred books. I mean, you're just out of a halfway house, and you're. And so then, there's a there uh, a, a a poster on the wall from uh, the local the National Gallery. And uh, in fact, if you look where my finger is here in the picture, right? That? Yeah, that's a that Kandinsky. Is. It's not the same one, but she goes. I go. Oh, I see you like the National Gallery. She says, Oh yeah, that's Kandinsky. That was 1938. You know, that's just before he came. Uh, Right after he came from Russia into uh, uh, Western Europe, and uh, this was this particular period of his painting, and goes on and on and on about Kandinsky and modern art. I mean, like it, it just uh, so the spinning. apple doesn't fall far from the tree because you're okay. getting the yeah interesting. So so then, but what the clincher was was that um, uh, this was back the, the 1988 fall elections were coming up. So uh, Ronald Reagan was one of the candidates for the republican party and, and neither of us liked them i Wait, had, i don't No, it was bush wasn't it in dukakis in 88 88 uh you're probably right let me uh, yeah reagan became president in 80 and then 88 was bush and dukakis it's the I'm first time my own, i voted so myself, I'm... 80 84 those are right yeah she's right there. okay well it's the 80 next. then sorry right <laughs> okay i was thinking back to how old was i <laughs> anyway the reagan joke it so took me longer reagan joke. <laughs> tell the reagan joke <laughs> well i don't even remember what the reagan joke was that's that's the joke of it but but whatever it was it was damn funny and yeah. and she erupts i mean just erupts laughing and it just showed me first of all it's a smart joke and she got the joke and I started laughing, but it was more than that. So that her, it was as though we both just opened. It's like her soul Aww. just like you could pull the screen back. And suddenly Aww. I could feel her mind. I could feel in here. I could feel her sense of humor in mine were the same. Our laughs were the same. And we're, it was just like this spontaneous, you know, moment. And it was just, I, I can't, it was, I, there's no way to describe it. I tried to in the book, but I can't describe what it was like. I mean, must have been having a. Must have been, been sort of validating in some yeah. way to to well, know. It it took a, it took I'd say six months for me to just as though my bell had been rung from this experience to kind of like try to uh, metabolize it, make sense of it. Yeah. But at the moment, it was so o overpowering. That's all I can say. It was, and then the clincher then was that, uh, I, and I knew I knew the answer to my own question, but I said I had to ask it anyway. I said. Well, when it's my birthday, do you, do you think of me? Mm -hmm. And she said, of course, of course I do. I always think of you. You know, she said, you have really great parents. I know you do, but, uh, you know, Mr. Stanford and all, but she said, uh, Mr. Stanford. you're always, you're always going to be my son. Always. Uh -huh. So that was like. Mm. There's not a so day next, she didn't think about it. I mean, this yeah. is. So the next day, um, I went out to see my other half sister. I came back and then. I had a couple hours with her. She introduced me to her roommate who was uh, struggling with schizophrenia and it introduced me as her son, which I, again, I just thought, man, this is in 24 hours. So I, in the book, it takes uh, reading it rather than saying it out loud, but about just that last moment with her uh, holding each other in our arms. I think knowing, knowing on some level, we're not going to see each other again after this. We're just what, not. And what the, happened? And, well, I I can't tell you what I mean oh. on a cognitive rational level I can't tell you but I can but I had liver, to, I had to leave, liver disease I'm living on or... the other side of the country 
Uh, but it was just, it was implicit somehow we weren't going to be doing a letter writing campaign. I wasn't going to be sending her money. Okay. She wasn't asking or looking for that. I think despite the, the reunion part of the big, powerful stuff, she had so much any struggles of her of her own that I think. Uh, but it was irrelevant because what needed to happen happened. And she told me, uh, did the two other girls that uh, they'd known about me all my life and that they had been waiting for me to show up all their lives. Oh, they had. So that mother child reunion was a hum dinner. But when I left, you know, I, I mean, I, it's a little dramatic, but it was really true. Uh, the last time I, you know, uh, uh, kissed her on the forehead and, and after holding her for a long time and, uh, Basically went out, it's just like a movie, went out into the cold and dark and, and, you know, icy night in a dank, dismal place with, with uh, Patty and got in her car and back, went back to my hotel. And I knew then, it's like, that's it. So, um, but that story, you know, that... that how that, much uh, longer, how much later yeah. was it before she died? About two years. Two years it seemed, it seemed relatively quick. And, what, and did, kept, course, did she stay in that that halfway house no or... i think she she went back to i'm not sure where she did but there were she might have lived with one of the two her two girls they lived in the area so uh, i can't it's a good question i don't know the, don't know the answer to that how old was but, she when she died Stephen? well she was probably uh, well she was roughly I, I think she was uh she must i was 40 i think she was 62 yeah young gee yeah oh. mm. but that 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 uh the kind of the both the tragedy and the yeah extraordinary event of the soul to soul communion uh I, the only other time I, that i've really experienced that i think my wife and i both did was when we adopted our son and when we met him for the first time i also talk about that and at that by that point i i know as i say in the book when he walked into our lives at age four his birth mother had been killed in a car wreck his birth father was basically a, a raging alcoholic at that moment living well at that time he was living in Saudi Arabia but he had been on the you know lived in Thailand lived in um, Antarctica uh, he had been bounced from pillar to post and uh, a totally charming kid then and now but when I saw him I was just like I got it I it was like I, I could just tell it was like uh, in fact I saw something on Something I was watching last night, a reminder about the Chilean. Remember the Chilean miners that got trapped at for yeah. two months? Yeah. It was like that. That that part of that wound, you are, you know, you that part of you is buried. It's, it's splintered and buried, and it's down there really deep. So it was not only we just it loved him from the get-go and vice versa, but it's like with the work with him is to try to bring him out of that, that psychological mind and do it in the most you know, everyday ways, but he had never had it really in everyday life. So all the things we did and we reconstructed the family on the spot. And uh, I'd say we did a pretty good job. He's, did he's, he ha uh, has he, has he had any contact with his own family, his biological family? And very minimum. He has no interest in doing that. Well, so far, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm almost, you know, if, he, if, if that changes, I'll be shocked. I mean, really huh. shocked. He's not interested. I think he, I think he has yeah. some he did meet his birth father once, and uh, uh, um, as we, the uh, three of us, my wife and he, and, uh, and, uh, met him in uh, Victoria, BC, and it was a, it was a nice time together. But at that time, the, the, the guy told me he said, "This is one of the best things I've ever done because I'm I'm a major fuck up. I mean, my life. He was a, he was an MD. They said his own daughter. He had five other kids over the affair that he had with a young girl to." Uh, a girl, not a young girl, a girl, a young woman, high school age, uh, that was Eddie was the uh, uh, product of, killed herself. Oh, so geez. distraught because the breakup of the family. So it was did, really another another did, train wreck. I mean, that's his story to tell. But did he meet any of his siblings, or does he have interest in that? No, we met one. Uh, we met the oldest of the girls, and she lives in this area. And uh, it was a it was a it was a head. <clears throat> It was it was uh, it was nice of her to she was friendly and everything, but when she started talking about her father, Eddie's birth father to us, she she ranted for the better part of an hour on just what a rotten sob that he was. We found him to be quite the opposite. He had been no, more than generous and quite a warm and really charming guy, even though he was screwed up. But 
But I think there was just something about that, that she was so bitter for what, what he had done to her and to the family that she, you know, she just say, soon spit on his grave and yeah. you know, give him the time of day. So, so well, I don't know. I, I can't say those are the reasons why, but I, you know, our, he's read my book. We, we bring up adoption, but I don't go any farther or deeper than, uh, than yeah, he and it's wants as to. Well, as your, as yeah. your own experience, yeah. right. Yeah. With your adoptive mother who, right. you know, you never know, like he could be feeling loyalty and all that stuff that makes him, I mean, I'm just saying having Louise and I having spoken to hundreds of adopted people over the years Mm -hmm. and a recurring theme, you know, he could have some of the same stuff that you had and just not, who knows? Who knows? But I have Um, to respect, respect where he's at with that. And uh, it doesn't influence our relationship or with my wife in the, in the slightest. Yeah. But that's that's the way it is, right? I mean, there are people that are all over the map in terms of curiosity, need to know. I'm glad you know about know. I'm I'm glad you know what he's what you know, that's the thing. You're educated about it. That it's there's so many kids out there with, and even parents don't want to know now, you know, maybe what's going on. Like, oh, let's not talk about that, you know. That's such a Yeah, I have to have to well, even talking about this issue about the prime in fact, it came up on uh, the uh, Willows Maternity Sanitarium Facebook in, in Kansas City. Uh, um, I think it was maybe, maybe I put something about something I'd spoken someplace. Uh, but one of the reactions was sort of like, well, where do you get off? Like talking about all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Be, you, you know, if you think your adoption was so bad, it was the best day of my life. It's sort of like, wait, I never said it was the worst day of my life. I, you know, things turned out great for me too. It's not really the point. But in other words, some people can be very sensitive to, to any kind of, psychological sort of push in to see what uh well it's, experience was like it's a, sense it's a of... scare you know coming out of the fog as it were uh can be life-changing and so people are really married yeah. to wanting to stay in this uh ideological place about adoption because right. it, once you once you start poking around in there your whole life suddenly at least shifts. for me yeah. shifts and changes in the way that i view it and the way that you know, everything added up and it's painful. So yeah, yeah, yeah. of course people want to stay in their comfort zone. And I have the advantage of, you know, working with clients all the time and uh, seeing parallels to that, Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's adoption or not about uh, uh, issues with parents and uh, uh, other relationships that uh, have, have ruptured and and, uh, people or people don't want to forget and forget, or people want to keep punishing or people want to stay stuck in being a victim. You know, it's comfort comf- for some people. I'll call it comfort, but it's it's a familiar place to be a victim, and and even though when you're paying the price for that, you kind of go, you know, you're paying a big price for just staying stuck here. There's a way to get unstuck if we work at it. Don't want to go there. Uh, there's a great I'd our say, habits are hard to break, aren't they? Yeah, the <laughs> uh, there, I think it's in the book. The I know it's on my website. The uh, a quote from Kemet Chodron. Uh, let let your heart break and drop the story, which to me is the key for any kind of therapy. Let your heart break and drop the story. So the problem is, is the story. You we guys tell ourselves lots of stories, mm-hmm. a lot of good stories, a lot of tragic stories, a lot of surprise stories. My story, uh, they're all legitimate stories. But if we have reasons, we only want to only want to cling to that story. Uh, it can, in, in effect, uh, retard us from actually getting down to our emotional truth. It's heartache or sadness or joy. So people can, can be very, uh, it's the human nature to, because it's self-protective. If I keep my story up as a victim or I got screwed over by my mom or my dad or you know whatever, uh, or the person who gave me up for adoption, if I hold on to that forever, I can stay there, but it's just, you know, you put a, a weight around your own neck. It's an albatross. And so uh, you have to have in some way, some glimmer or, or some, uh, recognition of the price you're paying and want to move on from that but uh, but that that core truth your core emotional truth um that is easy to talk about and hard to do for a lot of yeah, people to get close course. to that get close to whatever that is and it's not a it's not an idea it's not a it's it's a feeling so uh, i think that's, it's important that, that's that the work it, of therapy yeah and it's important that adoptees have someone even if they can't find well they should be able to but some people can't find in a, a therapist that's an adoptee but Mm -hmm. someone at least trained in early trauma and know about it because i think that's the 
I think so many people are miss don't have right. the right people to do that work with. Or right? even or Sometimes. even a small co community. Like I say, the uh, yeah. the the little I know, the people I ran into at the library. I mean, there's a lot of people from Kansas City. A lot of people came to the to the uh, to the commemoration of the plaque for uh, the Willows Maternity Sanitarium. Those people are in touch with each other. Yeah, uh, there's a lot and, of um. Community. There's a lot of um. You know, ad adoptee groups online in person. There's Adoptees yeah. Connect that a friend of ours uh, mm -hmm. started. There are a lot of resources. Um, I I don't know that it, it's really intellectually to to say all that is one thing, but but when it's you good. have a deep wound, you know, a separation from your mother. I, I think that takes a long time to heal, particularly yeah. when you live in a society where all you're told is that adoption is a wonderful thing. So you may be feeling deep down inside, I don't fit in, I feel different, I feel lonely and scared, but all around you is is a message that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't feeling, be that feeling that way. So therefore, yeah. often we don't get to really examine that and feel that, especially like when I grew up in Louise grew up, there were no adoption, adoptee trained therapists. They too thought it was a wonderful thing. So I'm just right. having a tiny bit of pushback to what you said, because I don't think that it's, oh, you're a victim holding on to your victimhood. I think that when you are not acknowledged your trauma and your pain, when you finally do get to, to get there, it takes a while to to uh, if Lifetime, ever if, if that's a he, is that a wound that can ever heal i honestly don't know i don't you know you can't always think of things from the intellectual standpoint you you know sometimes it might take a deeper uh, deeper kind yeah. of work the distinction I found work. My, so found myself making uh, actually with a client not long ago it wasn't adoption it was another kind of serious issue it was it's it's one thing to have your wound your trauma hang around your neck like a he heavy weight and it stays there and it, it interferes it's with you all the time it's another thing to learn to say not to forgive or forget but have it you know, kind of uh, metaphorically be able to put it over on the shelf for a while so you can be relieved from carrying around all the time and whatever is, feelings are associated with that you can still pull them off the rack that's what resilience is is being able to weather the ups and downs, in this case, of say, uh, either a positive or negative experience associated with separation or primal wound or adoption, that you can you can modulate yourself or be well self-aware so you can you can dive down deep into the heavy and, and sad or uh, hard feelings you may ha have, and they're not holding on to you, dragging you down all the time. Now, that takes some work because a lot of this stuff, the, the whole, from a, a depth psychological perspective, the the, the, the it's not the it's not the trauma mm -hmm. that's the problem it's the reaction to the to the trauma yeah but when that trauma happens pre-verbal and you don't have any recourse oh, yes. for that I, I i don't i mean i know you're trained and you're a phd i just don't know that i buy that <laughs> well i'm not asking you to buy it one way or the other I'm just saying because <laughs> a lot of this is i mean a lot of this is unconscious i mean it's 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 just you know it's even certainly for children can't have it and for other people yeah uh, the fact that the the response to uh, the, our psyches go through is that we we create a sort of dissociated space we we want to self protect against being hurt again yeah and so there's use typically there's one or two ways sometimes both we react to that to keep other people away don't hit my don't touch my 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 source most uh, uh, precious place in my life. Some of that's by pushing people away, being combative, having anger problems, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, or uh, being withdrawn, depressed. One way or the other, you're keeping people away from that wound. And that's what, that's why in therapy, uh, part of the, part of the job is to help be able to, to lower that barrier. So it becomes over time. Uh, so you don't have to feel like you have to live in a dis dissociated state to say self protect Yeah. I think, I think Sarah's, to Sarah's point, it's interesting listening to both of you. You know, I had a really, a good therapist who was educated in trauma, not an adoptee. And she did teach me some techniques, like, you know, you can bury something in the cemetery. Let's picture that and you go visit it. You know, you don't live in the cemetery. Let's go visit it there. And then you pull, that works for me until it doesn't work for me, if that makes sense. Like, <laughs> yeah. like it works for me often. I'd say during the work week, I'm handling things, but if something really kind of cutting or big gets yeah. in there it's like 
all all things, you know, and right. I'm pretty, pretty well versed in this compared to mm -hmm. many people out there. And I'm like a wreck, right? Now I'm back to being like, like Sarah said, a child, like oh, just heartbroken or right. abandonment. So I, I think I, I do agree that the work is, is so important, but I also think, I don't know that we ever heal or that, um, or there is, is that word healing? Is that really, maybe it's just, we learn to keep taking better and better care of ourselves type of thing. Yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, in fact, I did a podcast on that very thing not too long ago on what is healing. That's an endless, it's ineffable in some sense. Mm -hmm. but, and some um, people never can get there because, you know, their pain is manifested four times more. They've had another mm -hmm. trauma on top of a trauma, right. maybe sexual abuse. I mean, it keeps going, right? Like, yeah. But some of it's change, a radical change in perspective. Let me give you an example. This is years ago in Seattle, way before I thought I'd ever do what I'm doing today. In a large workshop by uh, uh, the guys that created a neuro linguistic program, they had us a large group. They had us pair off, uh, and uh, we, with our partner, supposed to tell us the other person your worst victim story, how you'd been done in by somebody or something that was just unspeakably horrible. So my partner and I did that, and we, we both was like, wow, that's really, a, mine's a pretty bad story, and yours is a pretty horrible story. And so the, after everybody had that sharing time, the leaders, I think they overheard somebody, asked one woman if she would be willing to tell her victim story, and she did. And uh, it was really hard to do. She talked about being in bed with, uh, in a bed in a second-story uh, apartment building. Uh, her baby was in a crib next to her, and the proverbial... Uh, you know, mad rapist got through the window, had a huge knife, slid into bed next to her, put the, the knife up to her throat and said, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to kill you and your baby. Mm -hmm. And so she did what she needed to do. And so he had her way with her for the rest of the night. And then he snuck out. Uh, the way she told it, of course, was just unbelievable. I mean, just a tearjerker. It was so hard to listen to. And to imagine what she had gone through was unbelievable. So then the leader said, okay, well, you know, we're all in tears. It's like, he goes, I'd like you to do something. I want you to tell the same story. We're going to give it a different headline. Now I want you to tell the story of how you saved your baby's life. Whoa. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Whoa. It's like yeah. when she told that, it was even a bigger tearjerker because everything had shifted. It was like it had a different meaning to it. It had a different perspective on how she, what she had done as in, in terms of self-sacrifice to spare her own life and uh, her babies, that's how far she would go to save both lives. That's right. A different story altogether. And I, I oftentimes, uh, in fact, I was with my own agent about something, and he was just talking yesterday about how he was, uh, well, I won't get into all that about what happened with him, but uh, but I, I said, you know, if you ever thought about um, in what way this, this really bad fallout he had with somebody actually quite famous has actually served you, He's still grousing about it, deeply wounded by it, 15 years later. I mean, can't get over it. It's like, and he and his wife both can't get over what happened to this guy, a famous spiritual leader. I said, so in what way has this actually served you? What, you know, it, it seems counterintuitive. It's like, no, it's just, it's just made me feel miserable all my life. So you kind of go, well, has this served you in some other way? That's, I think, working with people with depression, for example, or going through the dark night of the soul. Someplace in there, there's something else. There's some other gem of learning, some other kernel of something you don't quite know yet that you need to learn and integrate in, in ways that you can't really go out and make happen, but you can open yourself so that when they do happen, when you're paying attention to what life is trying to reveal to you, it happens. So I would say in my case, that, that sense of yearning and longing, incompletion, I can look at the downside of that, which I talk about in the book, but the upside, it's made me enormously curious. It made me very curious about people. Uh, it's driven me through my life. It's in, in ways in terms to define my emotional and my intellectual life. Uh, it's taken me to uh, probably uh, change professions a couple of times and actually write a book. So I can't say that's a, uh, an absolute uh, yeah. calculus. But no, and of course, that, like you, you, you do live your life, and if you, you know, hopefully you don't have regrets because that's. That's our one precious pointless. life, right? There yeah. was, um, Louise and I were interviewed for adoption.com recently. And one of the questions was, <clears throat> what, what is, what, what is something good you can say about adoption? And my response was, it's made me super resilient because when you, th the worst thing that you can imagine happening to a child is to lose their mm -hmm. mother, 
when it wasn't their choice, yeah. that makes you resilient. I mean, you can pretty much handle anything. Um, yeah, right. So I, in well, my case, it's... I think feelings of loss, and I think it was more so true when I was younger, but um, but I, I think I learned how to cry because of it. It let me go go down deep. I mean, private times by myself, when I found myself, I listened to a song and suddenly I'm in tears. Watch a movie, I'm in tears. It's like it it helped, I think, cultivate my own set, my own humanity. You know what I mean? It's like it really helped mm-hmm. cultivate to nurture that other side of my, you know, I put it in Jungian terms. I mean, it probably helped nurture my the more feminine side of me uh, as opposed to steeled up, you know, masculine side. But really helped soften and nurture that part. So that's a that was one of those. Uh, uh, rel- gifts without which, you know, who's to say what would have happened? I do find adoptees to be re- resilient if they keep going. If they, uh, it's interesting. I feel like we're a strong bunch, an empathetic, emotional bunch. Oh, I think so I too. like very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. And wow, this has been really we, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. We veered off from your story, but that means people can read your book. Yeah. To, I actually really actually... like the discussion. Yeah. To, to actually hear, to get the rest of your, I mean, your story. I need, um, I need a signed one. Yeah, please send Louise a signed <laughs> copy. We're, we're competitive about that. Yeah, we keep a library. <laughs> we got a one up. What? You two are I've got one over what? Louise right there. There keeps meeting no, the joking. authors. <laughs> That's now, Louise, right. I've met two now. I'm, I'm north of LA in uh, San Luis Obispo County. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. beautiful if you come out here you have to well i went to me. school i mean I, I my my doctorate's from stanford we lived in the bay area for yeah 20 years uh, my son lives in north hollywood i went to yeah pacifica's in santa barbara so it's it's uh, the territory oh yeah, well you're, oh yeah for sure up and down well this uh, has been i like California. this discussion i really yeah. like this so thank you for coming on and yeah, thank, thank you for being patient for it's me. been a long time yeah. yeah. Good, to, good, good to meet you. And uh, nice good. to see you again, sir. Nice to see you again, Stephen. Really great to okay. talk to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.